Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we are exploring the beautiful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England, following in the trail of Herbert Evans, who cycled around this region and wrote about his experiences in this wonderful book, The Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds, published in 1905, 114 years ago. Today you find Ross, Widget and me in the great town on the western Cotswold called Stroud. The huge success of the raw wool business in the Cotswolds which formed the basis of the wealth of the area resulting in so many of the spectacular homes, estates and churches we see everywhere we look changed quite dramatically after the reign of Henry VIII. Rather than exporting huge quantities of raw wool overseas to be made into cloth and clothing only to re-import it again for our own use, it became obvious that it was far more profitable to make our own cloth. Now Stroud, with its famous five streams that feed the river Frome, which is the river that runs westward through the town, was the perfect place to develop this new industry. The water not only provided the cleansing required in the wool processes, but it powered the many mills required to weave the cloth. So profitable did it become that in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the export of raw wool was banned altogether. Now, this had a very serious effect on the wool towns of the northern Cotswolds, like Chipping Camden, for example, but for Stroud, it guaranteed a highly prosperous future. The town and its surrounding villages flourished. Like so many of the villages in this region, there are signs of a settlement here from the Iron Age onwards. The Dubani sepulchres, Roman villas and roads all speak of busy communities. But the first proper record of a settlement was in 1221 as La Strode which probably refers to the marshy ground at the confluence of the River Frome and the Slad Brook. Although certainly the houses were built on the well-drained slopes at the end of the ridge. By 1279, the church had been built, which was to become the centre of the parish by 1304. The first market in Stroud was granted in 1594 and within less than a hundred years it had become the centre of the cloth trade, famous for its high quality, richly dyed broadcloth. In particular, it made military uniforms in what was commonly known as Stroudwater Scarlet. The marketplace, as was often the case in this part of the world, was close to the church. The square known as the Shambles, right in the shadow of the church itself, and still used as a small marketplace, shows signs of the market from about a hundred years or so ago. The table surfaces that fold out from the wall on which the traders displayed their wares, and the drainage grooves in the floor which took away any blood and detritus from the butcher's stalls. It's all still there for us to see and imagine the noise and smells. It seems there's something in the water of the five streams that feed the valley of the Stroud, that engenders radical politics. There's always been a passionate political undercurrent here. In 1837, John Russell became Stroud's MP. He was highly instrumental in designing the Second Reform Act, giving the vote to all urban male householders, not just the rich ones. Hardly universal suffrage, it must be admitted, but it was a step in the right direction. A statue of George Holloway, a highly successful clothing manufacturer, can be found outside the Working Men's Conservative Association Benefit Society, which he founded in the late 1800s. This became the original Holloway Society and set the ground for us all to buy our homes and life insurance by affordable subscription. More recently, the town was one of the birthplaces of the organic food movement, and home to the very first organic cafe in Britain. The Biodynamic Agricultural Association is based in the town. 
and local politicians lean strongly in the direction of the Green Party. There's also a strong pacifist movement in the town. Such is the depth of local feeling, and so strong is the determination of the local population, that it takes a very brave, or possibly foolish, person or organisation to take them on. One of the recent plans by the local council to sell the wonderful subscription rooms building in the centre of the town is a case in point. After an extremely public struggle, the building was saved and is now run by a local trust set up for the purpose, providing music, arts and an amazing venue for everyone in Stroud. Many people tell me the Beatles performed here in the 1960s. I can't actually find any evidence of this, but for me the rumour is easily a good enough reason to protect it. In the late 1700s, a canal was built linking Stroud with the River Severn, and then, a little later, east to the River Thames through the Sapperton Tunnel. This huge improvement in communications, followed by the railways in 1845, meant that the town and its surrounding villages roughly doubled in population. Great mills were constructed along the rivers, in particular that of the Frome running east through Chalford, where the extraordinary settlements hanging on the sides of the valley are wonderful to see. Even in the middle of the 20th century, daily deliveries of bread were made to these houses by donkey, such was the steepness of the terrain. This is true of quite a lot of the valleys around here. There isn't any doubt the feeling and atmosphere of the Stroud region is different from the rural Cotswolds we've visited to date. It is, however, fascinating. And the current gargantuan efforts to restore the canals and mills and tunnels of the area are testament to the beauty and interest of the industrial architecture of the time. We're heading up the Golden Valley through Chalford, following the canal and railway, past the mills, up the hill to the top of the ridge towards Minchin Hampton. At the top we see, in the distance, an old friend of the explorer, the Jolly Nice Farm Shop. We visited a few years ago with Alexis Thompson, my cookery guru, and if you're in the area, I suggest you buy the ingredients for your next meal here. The last time I was there, I met one of the presenters of the BBC Countryfile programme doing just that. Now there's a recommendation. We're on our way to Minchinhampton. So here we are in the lovely village of Minchinhampton. The name Minchin is of ancient origin. It's derived from the word Minchin with an E, meaning a nun, and refers in this case to the fact that the village and its surrounding lands were given by William I to the nuns of the Abbe aux Dames in Caen in northern France. It provided wealth to the abbey from its wool trade and, of course, rents. About three miles southeast of Stroud, Minchinhampton lay on important local roads and had a market from about 1269. It looked a bit more like a town by the beginning of the next century, but in the Middle Ages the town appears to have been important chiefly as a centre of sheep farming. The development of the town occurred mainly in the 17th century, and it remained a market and shopping centre of local importance for 200 years. Sitting, as it does, high up on the top of the ridge, there have been settlements here since early history, and the enormous green which surrounds the village is dotted with ancient earthworks, which demonstrate its ancient origin. This green is still common land, and there are cattle grazing in the fields at all times, loose and in no way enclosed. It's not in the least unusual to find livestock wandering the streets of Minch, clogging the traffic over which they most certainly have precedence. The church is cruciform in shape, with a central tower and a rather unusual truncated spire. There was certainly a Norman church here, for in 1842, before the restoration of the church, there remained, on the north side of the nave, four Norman arches, and in the wall above, two small Norman windows, deeply recessed, and splayed. 
and in the north wall of the chancel two windows similar to those in the nave were found walled up. The other parts of the ancient church were largely 14th century, with a few alterations made in the 16th century. The chancel of the old church was considerably longer than the present one. This so-called restoration in 1842 consisted of the demolition of the ancient nave and chancel, which were then rebuilt. The only old parts of the church are therefore the two transepts and the tower, which date from the 14th century. Over the entrance archway, the west window shows the four Latin doctors of the church, St Ambrose, St Jerome, St Augustine of Hippo and St Gregory the Great. All are in full canonical dress and St Gregory, of course, wears the triple crown of the papacy. This window was erected in 1899. Together with those in the south aisle, it was designed and made by Herbert Bryans, a brother of Edward Lonsdale Bryans, who was rector from 1896 until 1912. On the day Ross and I were here, there was a market in town, which was a brave thing to be doing in the middle of a pandemic year. It was held in the old market building, built in the centre of the square, and it shows just what a pretty town this is, perched on the edge of the very steep escarpment, which we're now going to head down westwards to try and find the Cotswold Escarpment itself. We've come west from Minchinhampton through Nailsworth, which is a little village nestling in the bottom of a valley, driven straight through it heading due west out towards the escarpment. And here we found the most amazing car park. This is a picnic spot, an official picnic spot, and just look at the view behind me. It's a view right over the Severn Valley you can see the Severn Estuary and in the distance the mountains of Wales. It's the most extraordinary sight. It's wonderfully windy today, so it's dramatic um, and we're having an absolutely wonderful time here. It is definitely well worth seeking out this part of the Cotswold Escarpment. We've driven due east from Minchinhampton and the escarpment overlooking the Severn and we've come to the town of Sirencester. Straddling the River Churn, the town is on the very edge of the Vale of the White Horse. But as Herbert Evans writes in 1905, let the visitor who has followed us in our rambles from Stowe take his stand in the clean wide marketplace. And as he looks around him at the substantial stone-built houses, say whether he does not feel himself still to be in a Cotswold town. This ancient town was originally settled by the Romans in about 43 AD, after the successful invasion of Britain by Emperor Claudius. They built a fort here and started to build the road system for which they were, of course, justly famous. The Foss Way linked Exeter and Lincoln, passing through the Cotswolds, and Ermine Street, which ran northwest to southeast from Wales and Gloucester all the way to Silchester on the south coast. And they crossed in what became the middle of the Roman town of Corinium Dobonorum. Now, the local British tribe called the Dobunny who had put up with little or no resistance to the invasion, remained here and the town became their main administrative centre. It was the second largest town in Britain, covering 240 acres, and the population was around 15,000, so not far short of what it is today. Roman remains are continuing to be excavated in the city, and the new museum is full of fascinating artefacts. We're going to show you around. Not surprisingly, Sirencester's Roman history remains largely underground, but recent archaeology has revealed increasingly fascinating details of what was certainly one of the most important towns in the Roman Empire. The Forum, a large market square surrounded by colonnaded shops, was about 100 metres by 70 metres in size, with a huge public building on its south side, the Basilica. And it was from this building that the town was administered, as was local justice. 
There will have been substantial Roman baths and probably a theatre, neither of which have yet been found. But signs of what seems to have been the worship of Jupiter have been uncovered and can be seen in the wonderful Corinium Museum. At its peak, this city was extremely grand, with wide streets and colonnades decorated with elaborate mosaics, and one of the biggest amphitheatres in the country, which we shall visit shortly. At the end of the Roman occupation in 415 AD, Saracester was largely abandoned. It wasn't until 577 that the Saxons took it over, by which time the place was a mere shadow of its former self. Little record of the Saxon use of the town remains, but in the 9th century the foundation of the Minster Church of St Mary, probably by the king, signalled the start of the re-emergence of the town. It lasted until the 12th century, when it was replaced by the Augustinian Abbey, also dedicated to St Mary, the grounds of which just south of the parish church, which still stands, form a wonderful park. If you stand by the lake at the bottom of the park and imagine the enormous abbey dwarfing the lovely parish church still standing, you get an idea of the scale of the iconoclastic vandalism perpetrated in 1539 by Henry VIII at the dissolution of the monasteries. Saracester was affected by civil war, both at the time of Matilda and Stephen in the mid-12th century, when the latter burned and destroyed the fortifications which were probably sited where the present mansion house is to be found, behind the huge yew hedge at the bottom of Park Street. And in the 17th century war, when the townspeople were largely supportive of the parliamentarians, and the gentry and clergy mainly royalist. This meant regular skirmishes in the town until in February 1643 it was taken by the king's nephew Rupert. The battle for the town was brutal and nearly 400 people were killed. At the end, over a thousand were imprisoned in the church before being marched off to Oxford. In the 18th century, the wool business so important to the town, moved, as we've already discovered, towards Stroud, but the canal from the Thames to the Severn kept Sarancester busy with coal-related industries, and the arrival of the railways also contributed to its success. On the western edge of the town is the amazingly well-preserved Roman amphitheatre. Ross and I were entranced by this place. As you walk over the slopes and ridges of this extraordinary earthwork, it's impossible not to imagine the roaring crowds and spectacular entertainments that took place here, often, but not always, extremely gruesome. There are two kinds of reactions from people who visit this place. Those like Ross, whose instinct is to reach for high ground for the best possible view, and those like me, who immediately walk onto the stage and imagine what it would have been like to perform in front of this huge Roman crowd. Chacun en son goût is what I say. This extraordinary town deserves some more detailed attention from us, and we will return here when we're able to show you all the wonderful museum, the inside of the church, and to talk to local experts about the remarkable history of the town. Sarancester is an absolute must for the Cotswold Traveller. We've come pretty much due south from Sarancester, um, the Roman, great Roman centre in Sarancester, to a town called Malmesbury. This extraordinary place has had a settlement since time immemorial. There was an Iron Age state settlement here. Um, and then, of course, there was this amazing abbey behind me, this remarkable building. Um, it was built originally in the 12th century. Uh, it was extremely large, built on a cruciform uh, style. And uh, there's not a great deal of it left, but what there is is still absolutely spectacular. Christianity probably first reached the town of Malmesbury in about 600 AD. An Irish monk called Meldulf 
set up a school here, but it was the first king of all England, Athelstan, born in 895 AD, who put the town firmly on the map. Before him, the first abbot of Malmesbury Abbey was Aldhelm. He had connections with the royal family of Wessex and a good relationship with the Pope, so his power was substantial. His diocese was extensive and his expertise extremely varied. The abbey, the early abbey, housed the first church organ in England, built at least under his supervision and possibly largely by him. He was canonized in 1080, but even before that his burial site in the abbey grounds was an important pilgrimage destination, adding to the success of the town. The rise of Athelstan, King of All England, was just the first of royal connections to the area, which continue to this day. Very close to here, both the elder children of our Queen Elizabeth have their country homes. Highgrove, famously the favourite home of Prince Charles, and Gatcombe Park, the estate bought for Anne, the Princess Royal, when she first married, and for where she famously runs world-class equestrian events. We have a small connection with Gatcombe. One of Widget's long line of canine predecessors, a wonderful black and white Springer Spaniel, was born there. The farm manager and his wife bred him and we bought him in the 1980s. I asked the farmer to keep him for a month or two to carry out his basic training, something he was expert at and I wasn't. After some thought, we decided to call him Chateau Petrus, he was known as Chateau for short. After a couple of weeks, I got a phone call from Gatcombe and the farmer said to me, Robin, when I train a dog, I always use the first syllable of their name so that they recognise it and react to it quickly. Have you any idea what the reaction of Her Royal Highness has been to my running around her estate shouting the first syllable of your dog's name? Fortunately, and not in the least surprisingly, her reaction was actually one entirely of amusement and Chateau kept his name. His siblings and he became well-known figures around Gatcombe, after which he came to us, wonderfully trained, living happily with us for a very long time. I always had the slight impression, however, that he felt he'd rather come down in the world. Returning to the 6th century, Athelstan had a very warm place in his heart for Malmesbury. He was a highly effective ruler, introducing the regional divisions that became shires, allowing local control over law-keeping by the introduction of Shire Reeves, later sheriffs, to oversee the county. He also started what was known as the Commoners of King's Heath, which gave to the people of the town land from the King's Heath for grazing. This tradition continues to this day. The wonderful water meadow at the foot of the hill on which the abbey stands, called King's Heath, is part of this gift. And from here, you get an incredibly strong idea of how medieval Malmesbury must have felt. The wonderful abbey, the remnants of which we see today, and in whose cafe great coffee is to be had while you tour this incredible building, was built in the 12th century, cruciform in shape, with a spire that was higher than at Salisbury, which these days is the highest spire in England. Needless to say, the town was embroiled in the Civil War of the 17th century, ending with a vicious battle on the 24th of May 1644, when parliamentarians under Colonel Massey attacked the town with artillery and a large body of troops. The fact that the town remained intact at all is down to the fact that Massey would not let his troops plunder the place. The usual Cotswold commercial pattern applied to Malmesbury, success with wool followed by a decline and the emergence of the silk industry, and in this case a specialising in the making of lace. This latter was helped by the arrival of many Dutch immigrants with the special lace making skills for which they were famed. We've skated over the wonders of this lovely town. We never profess to be a comprehensive chronicler of the Cotswolds hoping that we will inspire you to come and find out for yourselves how wonderful the region is. If you do manage to do so, don't miss Malmesbury. Come here and see the many things we haven't told you about, including the old Bell Hotel, reputed to be the oldest purpose-built hotel in England.
just a few miles, kind of northwest of Malmesbury, we've come to the little village of Tetbury. This is another place with an incredible history, both political and architectural history. Um, and we're going to show you around this lovely place. This lovely town sits on a hill and therefore had little or no cloth trade to rescue it from the collapse of the raw wool trade. There was no way to power the mills necessary for the change. However, it survived extremely well with a busy general market. Royal patronage made a difference and even today with the Prince of Wales's house Highgrove just a stone's throw away, the royal influence is keenly felt. Restaurants, shops and galleries abound and the feel of the place is one of activity and busyness. In 1086, 72 inhabitants of Tetbury were recorded. In about 1710, it was said that the parish contained 300 houses and around 1,200 inhabitants. And the population rose only gradually to roughly 3,500 by 1871. Boundary changes make any comparison a little difficult now, but it's unlikely to be much bigger than that now. In 1144, Stephen's army camped at Tetbury during his operations against the Earl of Gloucester's castles in the neighbourhood. And in the early 16th century, Tetbury was drawn into the feud between Morris Lord Barclay and the Duke of Buckingham. Hoping to win favour with Morris, who was Lord of the Borough, the bailiff and burgesses prevented the Duke from lodging in the town on his way from Thornbury to London. A meaningful but genteel insult that somehow epitomises the town even today. The main route through Tetbury brought several rulers of England to the town, although only ever in passing. Edward I, Charles I, Charles II, James II and Queen Anne all passed through. But it shouldn't be long now before the town has its very own resident King of England. The Church of St Mary the Virgin is a lovely example of the Gothic revival architecture we've seen often before in the region. Built on the site of a Saxon church towards the end of the 18th century and designed by Francis Huon of Warwick, it was opened in 1781. It's one of the earliest and best examples of Georgian Gothic churches in the country. Since 1781, the church has undergone several changes the most significant being in 1901 and then in 1993. This last restoration attempted to undo much of the Victorianization that had taken place in 1901 and restore the interior as far as possible and practicable to its original Georgian plan. The tower is 187 foot high and is believed to be the fourth highest in the country. It contains a ring of eight bells, most of which were cast in 1722. The church has some box pews, which are accessed from a passageway around the side of the church rather than the central aisle. Dramatic stained glass includes work by Clayton and Bell and William Wales, and a large candelabrum dating from 1781 hangs high above the nave. The market held on the day Ross and I arrived in Tetbury was, rather like that in Minchinhampton, a brave but ghostly version of its normal self. Let us truly hope that the progress of 2021 will bring us back to a situation where markets, trade in general and social jollity can return some way towards life as we used to know it. This, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of our episode 6, which we are actually quite pleased, not to say surprised, to have managed to produce in this terrible year. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and Ross and I are now working hard on finding ways we can talk about our lovely Cotswolds, despite the restrictions we're all under. Keep in touch, please, and we'll see you again very soon.